and welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Today, I'm joined by Alex Bernhardt, Global Head of Sustainability Research. Welcome, Alex, and thanks for joining me. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Daniel. One of the topics that's coming up ever more in, in our conversations, I imagine, as well in yours, uh, is sustainable development. And what I was hoping to talk about a bit today is maybe exactly what that is. Uh, we have, as a reference point, for example, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. Uh, we also have goals that were published with the Paris Agreement. Could you share with us a bit exactly what those goals are and maybe as important, talk about what it's going to take to try to achieve those goals? Certainly. So the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs as they're more commonly referred to, really articulate a, a future in which we've tackled a number of the sustainability challenges that are facing the global economy today. So, uh, for instance, they, they articulate a, a future in which poverty has been eliminated, climate change has been largely addressed, uh, we have access to education and energy and other basic services is more universal. Um, and so many of the SDGs focus on uh, north-south or, or developing versus developed market issues that need to be addressed. And in order to get to the place where we have indeed addressed all 17 of those SDGs, a huge amount of expenditure is required. Uh, the UN Commission on Trade and Development, uh, or UNCTAD, estimates that the SDGs will require as much as five to seven trillion dollars in new investment each year. That estimate was from 2015 to 2030. And indeed, here we are at 2022. We, we have not been spending that amount annually up until now from 2015. And so that, that number is, is probably larger for the next eight years or so if we want to get to the point where the SDGs have been successfully accomplished. So there's clearly you know a huge capital allocation that is needed in order to get to the place where we can say we've we've uh, we've achieved the SDGs. Now, of course, those are those are big numbers. That said, uh, in a sense, they sound smaller now than perhaps they would have a couple of years ago. Because one of the things, of course, that we've we've uh, learned with the pandemic is we can do things we didn't think we could do, uh, and can spend money uh, in a way we didn't think that we could do. So that I would I would imagine is a, a positive development, even if, as you point out, we probably still have a long ways to go. Part of the challenge then, I think, in, in getting to, to those goals uh, is perhaps on the theoretical side. And we think about kind of macroeconomic concepts that uh, at times are used to argue against the feasibility or the desirability of spending this kind of money uh, to reach these goals. What are some of the concepts that perhaps are standing in the way of spending these types of sums to, to reach the objectives that we're aiming at? Broadly, there are two different issues that seem to be standing in the way of, of increasing expenditure to support the, the SDGs and the, and the Paris Agreement. The first, there's the continual refrain in government halls that you are familiar with hearing, which is, how are we going to pay for that? Uh, this idea that we need to balance the budget uh, for our government. Um, is is a continued area of debate. Um, there's also the role of central banks as independent players uh, with a specific focus on their price stability and, and employment mandates. Those are uh, broadly the two issues that that lead to consideration of expenditure being insufficient to to address some of these uh, broader SDG. Uh, topics that, that we're talking about. And so relative to the first concern on, on budget balancing, what we've learned from a lot of the debate around modern monetary theory and, and much of the research that, that underpins that, that whole uh, branch of emerging branch of econ economics is that if you have access to an ability to produce your own uh, money, your debt is denominated in, in your own currency, the ability to default is really not there. You, you, you have always the ability to meet your, uh, your obligations if you can, uh, to put it bluntly and, and not very technically, if you can print your own money. This is true, I think, theoretically, even if other policy choices may be preferable in extremists. Uh, and you know, we've seen circumstances in which uh, there have been threats not to pay bills in, in certain developed countries. But for the, for the most part, again, I think the theory there is pretty sound. The, the bigger concern around this, how are we going to pay for that rhetoric, is that large fiscal expenditures may lead to inflation. And, and there's definitely some validity there, though, if we put this in historical context, what we saw in you know the great financial crisis, there was a lot of, of predictions back then 
uh, that after we implemented quantitative easing, it would lead to hyperinflation. That did not occur. We've had several U.S. administrations over the last um, decade plus expend large amounts of, of money in, in deficit territory, uh, which has not led to runaway inflation. We are now uh, expending quite a lot of money uh, to combat the pandemic. We are seeing some inflation. Some of that is being driven pr- presumably by the increase in expenditure, but it's also being impacted by supply side constraints uh, related to the pandemic. So all this to say that our experience of the last 10, 15 years uh, economically has really shown us that governments likely have, especially reserve reserve currency governments, likely have a lot more capacity to spend than was previously thought. And hopefully we can take some of that, uh, that thinking and apply it to the SDGs going forward. The secondary issue around central bank independence is also an emerging field of interest. We're seeing um, central banks Collectively, uh, 90 plus central bank uh, organizations and and related organizations have joined up into the network for greening the financial system, uh, which is now focusing on trying to um, enhance the role of the financial system to to manage risks and to mobilize capital for green and low carbon investments, uh, which is a really big step in the direction of uh, what's sometimes referred to as functional finance. But in short, what that means is broader coordination between central banks and fiscal governments uh, around the the purpose of spending and, and the allocation of capital so that they can address big sustainability challenges like like climate change. And so what we're seeing now, based on these conversations in, in macroeconomic uh, circles, is a, a shift in the direction of related monetary and, and fiscal policy and practice towards something that's more functional, towards greater expenditures. And I think it's that kind of uh, direction in travel, that shift in, in expectations that investors need to be aware of and, and monitoring. So up to now, we've been discussing quite quite big concepts, uh, long-term goals, macroeconomic policy. Maybe you can help uh, bring it down to a level that uh, is relevant uh, more immediately, perhaps, to our investors. If you're an investor listening to this, you think about potentially significant macroeconomic changes, potentially large sums of money being spent to achieve these goals. What does it mean for them? How do they think about their portfolios? So for for investors, I, I'd say that the impact of this shift in, in thinking and in, in practice practice is manifold. For one, there's a growing recognition now uh, from central banks and other financial regulators that that climate change and other sustainability trends represent systemic risks. And those systemic risks need to be managed by financial institutions writ large. There's also a growing recognition on the sort of expenditure side, whether it's uh, the application of uh, fiscal policies or the application of, 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 in some cases, monetary policies that capital needs to be spent to transition the economy to a, a low carbon future uh, in order to achieve the the Paris Agreement and, and the SDGs and mobilizing that capital using all the tools that central bankers and, and fiscal policymakers have at their disposal is likely going to be necessary to mobilize that volume of capital that I referenced earlier on, five to seven trillion dollars annually over the next eight years or so, if not more than that. And so what investors can do to position themselves to benefit from uh, what is, is likely to be a, a massive increase in expenditure in these in these low carbon sectors of the economy is position their portfolios towards sustainable growth opportunities. Invest in thematic funds that are looking to target the energy transition or the low carbon revolution, and make sure that uh, you're you're paying attention to these policy and and practice shifts because they will have an impact on portfolios certainly over the medium term uh, and definitely over the long term. If we reflect then on what Alex has shared with us, he first off listed some of the sustainable development goals, uh, such as limiting the increase in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees, also hoping to eliminate poverty, uh, quite ambitious goals, which are going to require equally ambitious sums of money. And then the discussion turned to, well, exactly how is this going to work? And also discuss some of the roadblocks, conceptual roadblocks, perhaps, uh, that we see in terms of macroeconomic theory uh, around the objective to have balanced budgets. And and Alex raised very relevant questions about how uh, stringent that requirement should be, Uh, questions around the role of central banks, uh, and also importantly, what the potential impact might be on inflation. What does this all mean for investors? Well, hopefully at a minimum, it turns out to be uh, a really significant opportunity as we ideally see at least some of these sums being invested by governments, by private companies to try to achieve some of these sustainable development goals. 
Well, that's all we have time for today. If you'd like more information, reach out to your BMP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. For listeners who have devices with Alexa, you can ask Alexa to enable Investment Insights or search for Investment Insights on Amazon under the category Alexa Skills. My thanks to Alex for sharing his insights. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Daniel. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with Fiona Wills about the outlook for European equities. Until then, we hope you stay safe and take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.